So it can't go by itself, all right? That's way, that 
That was way back when we tried to do y by itself and it didn't work out and we learned about implicit differentiation. Uh, so you're going to do three y Bring that three down. Oh, yeah. There you go. What are you trying to do ultimately here? I just want to make it a bit more simple, so I can answer that. I can plug in 2 comma 1 into the y. Okay. So 2 to so an x is going to 1 to the y. So we're looking at when it's at 2 comma 1. Mm -hmm. So x will equal 2, right. y equals 1, and we're going to try to figure out what y prime is. Okay. So then we just put y equals 1, so the We got one there, plus three y prime. Oh, and <coughs> two right here as well, so that'd be six y prime. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Six y prime plus four.
Good. Good job, Aaron. Okay. Are anything? Yeah. Where are we then? Um, I think like just remembering to do like the white prime when you're doing the product drill and everything like that. Remember uh, for implicit differentiation, remember you use the chain rule, so you do the white prime. What else? Remember when these are product rule. Remember to yeah. use the product rule. Don't forget. Any product of, of two functions, you need the product rule. You didn't learn it, but I emphasize how Careful, you have to be doing every single time. Being meticulous, keep track of everything. Just reminding us of that. So here's just a helpful hint when you're taking a test like this and you see the kinds of statements that they're making are about um, concavity and extrema. Okay, so it's, it would be helpful for you to have a picture of what this graph might look like so you, maybe you can eliminate some things. So what would the graph of x to the fourth minus 2x cubed possibly look like? Kind of like a parabola. parabola or maybe like a w yeah. at most is going to have that many. Uh, you do have your calculator, so you can grab your calculator and see what it looks like. Uh, it's faster to have a mental knowledge of what this might look like and then maybe use your calculator afterwards. Um, so, go ahead, Sophie. So tell us what do you think. A, could that possibly be true? Well, uh, let's look at the, say the graph of x to the fourth minus 2x to the third from our years and years of graphing polynomials. It's going to look like maybe like that or maybe like a W like that, like a bendy parabola. Okay. Uh, so. It's not a parabola. Only parabola is only for second degree. Oh. It looks parabola-like, but it's not going to be a parabola. Parabola is for second degree polynomials only. What's more Okay, you gotta do some extrema, right? It's gotta have at least a minimum. Well, when I say there's no relative, does that mean that you can still have like a, what is it, the ultimate? The, the absolute. Absolute, yeah. Uh, yeah, the absolute extrema are also relative. Okay. That's um, not it. The graph of function with one point is an inflection, and the function has two relative extrema. Could it possibly only have two relative extrema? One or three. Couldn't possibly have two, so maybe we can mark these off as we eliminate them. The graph of the function has two points in the left is two, and the function has one relative. Okay, could it have two? Could have two points in reflection and one relative extrema? Oh, it could have one. Maybe. Okay, so let's say maybe. The graph of the function has two points in reflection and the function has two relative. Uh, well, 
Um, let's see what the equals x to the fourth minus saying that it's E that has three relative extrema? Does this look like it has three extrema? Well, could it have three? Yeah. Yeah, if you zoom in far enough, it might. Okay, well, this isn't saying to cut it off. I'm just zooming in to see what the shape of it looks like, right? So it's not saying that we're gonna cut it off. Uh, so we'll assume it just keeps on going forever, so that those aren't extrema. What about, this looks like a relative minimum, right? Mm -hmm. What about here, do we have a relative extrema here? Could have two. Could have two. Could have two, yeah, you could, could just come down and go up just a little bit and you have two extrema, okay? Or you can find a derivative. So, if we have two extrema, then we should have one, two, three places where the derivative is zero, instead of just, well, if, if there are no extrema here, how many times will the derivative be equal to zero? Two, actually. Well, possibly two, maybe just one. If this doesn't quite go horizontal, then yeah. Okay. So to know for sure, we've got to take the derivative, maybe, instead of equal to zero. Um, if there, if there's only one relative extrema, that means that there's no extrema here. Can we find extrema with the calculator? Yeah. Sophie, can you show us that then? Find extrema with the calculator? Okay. Yeah, we'll there you go. Uh, a second calc. <coughs> you want to find, yeah, you got it. You want to find, uh, well, let's say a minimum. Left bound means go to the left of where you think the minimum is. What does it look like that minimum might be? We're looking for extrema here. Oh. Right. Looks good. Yeah, anywhere to the left is fine. Then go to the right of where you think the minimum is. There, and then give it a guess, like get it close to the minimum. Maybe it's given us a, a minimum, but it also maybe it's given us a minimum of just the interval that we gave it. That might be true. Uh, so, we could also try to zoom it in again. There isn't a, a, a minimum and a maximum, it's really tiny. So maybe we should just go ahead and take the derivative and set the derivative equal to zero, see if it's equal to zero. If it's just twice, then what we have is a minimum over there, and then back over here to the left we have just a flat spot. But if we get it three times, then we'll have three double
what if we just keep buying that? Two times. Two times. So could I have three extrema? No. No, it couldn't. So, so what if we just eliminate it? Could be E. And D is bound on D. And D is bound. Guys, we see. This one is. Like even with the shape that it is, which is flattened out and comes down like that, it was, it's like, couldn't have two extrema. If have two extrema, you'd have to have maximum, minimum, and then just go off to infinity. And then come back down, then you get another extrema. When, yeah, when the degree would be odd, that's that would be possible. But uh, with uh, an x to the fourth, we're going to have like a parabola s shape with possibly some waviness in the middle, uh, where we have some uh, possible extrema. So this process of elimination there told us that uh, we we could possibly have one or three, not two extrema. So if it's saying two extrema, that's not going to work. Uh, it definitely has some extrema. That's you, you can't say a. That's not going to um, so we didn't have to worry about how many points of reflection we had, right? But even still, looking at the graph, how many points of inflection does this have? Stop me when I get to a point of inflection. Right. Stop. Here? No. 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 Up that's, right. that's, that's what concave up. Oh, it's concave up. Okay, stop me when I get to a point of inflection. There. About there is good. Stop me when I get to another one. Yeah. There as well. Okay. So there's another point of inflection because we go from concave up, there's concave down for just a little bit, and then concave up again. So definitely points of inflection two and one. Somebody else? Oh, yeah. it's ready? Oh. oh, gosh. Thanks, so. All right. I know. Uh, I just got to get over it. sine or tangent or any trig function it's to the power, it's the sine of 3 minus x the whole thing is squared. Alright. So it's within the square function. Oh, mm. it's just, it's a, just a lot of change right here. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So, I'm going to write it. Sure, we could use the product rule in that, or we could use the chain rule. Yeah, that's true. Chain rule is really easier. Ooh, tiny there. Oh, I mean, it's gone. Okay, um, so we can do This just kind of depends on what the test is going to say. Like, what way are they going to get us to? 
Maybe they say negative two sine three cosine three. Then you know, or maybe they give you a decimal. Or maybe they give you some other trig function. You gotta be able to figure out which of those is the same as the thing that you have. So which is it? B. Challenge because it would be technically part of chapter seven, but Wait, so we already did ten. Yeah, we did just we did oh, ten. Okay. For ten, we just change x the square root of x to x to the one half, okay. and then distribute, and then use the power rule for. Oh, okay. 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 You got an idea? Why don't you uh, lay it out verbally for us first? Okay, so the find the area of the shader region. Yeah. Is Okay, so that's something we should probably find uh, out. So, so you can find the area of like area of the curve below by finding like the <coughs> anti we do that anti derivative. <coughs> right, we do the antiderivative fundamental theorem of calculus. And we the fundamental theorem of calculus and we get the area there. Area under what? Uh, under the under that spot the set between those two intervals. Of the what would that look like? The, you do the definite integral of what? Of x minus x squared, the curve function. Of x minus x squared? Yeah. Well, x, 5x minus oh, 5x minus x squared. So you do the definite integral from, from 0 to, to, whatever, point that is. to whatever, let's call it b, uh, of 5x minus x squared. Yeah. dx. Right. What will that give you? Area under the parabola. Yeah. I would subtract that with the area under the, the area under the line. Okay, so great. That's, and that's just a triangle. And that's easy. So to get the area under there, um, and then uh, then you have this area. Right. If we take this big red area minus this blue area, we'll get this guy right here. So we'll subtract zero to b of two x dx. So you can do both of those. Oh, I need to know what b is. How do I know what b is? B is, what, what is B? B is a number. Somewhere on the, which axis? The x-axis. From 0 to here. Trying to figure out what that is. Right? There is like a, a tried and true classic way of finding where two graphs oh, intersect. Oh, 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 you take that function and yeah. you take each of the other function. Yeah. So you make x squared minus oh. x squared minus Five x minus x squared equal to two x and solve for x. So we get three x minus x squared equals zero minus uh, factor in x. We get three minus x equals zero. X equals zero or x equals three. Which we already knew is zero. Which by looking at it, three is b. Uh, 
cubed. Okay, we're going to do that from uh, zero to three. Well, here's the thing. We're going to take the antiderivative of this, right? Yeah. And then we're going to plug in three, plug in zero, and subtract, right? So actually, what we could do here. Zero is going to make equal nine, so it's going to be three by three. Is say, well, huh. let's just take this to be one big function. Yeah. We're going to take the antiderivative, we're going to plug in three, we're going to plug in zero. It's all going to be the same thing, right? So. I guess that's what chapter seven is gonna teach us about. So what's the antiderivative of that? It's two x. We got minus x squared. We're gonna go from zero to three. Plug in three, so five halves times nine minus one third times. Take that and subtract. We plug zero in, but if we plug zero into that, that's all zero. Just take that zero, um, and now we get uh, twenty-seven divided by three is nine. So we get that that and that together, negative eighteen, um, and we got five halves times nine. So we've got forty-five over two, forty-five over two minus thirty-six over two. Negative, no, not negative. Um, that is nine over two. Nine over two. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not so wrong. Oh, this is good. Uh, that's good. Uh, that's good. I forgot you have 36 over two. Oh, I got mine. Oh, yeah, I got mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it? back here, plug in three, and add our calculator, so that is not going to work. Okay, that's what's up. Um, remember, let's, let's come back to 13 a little bit later. So you look at the slope fields, and you and, and look at for slopes that you can pick out easily. Slopes like zero, slopes like undefined, slopes that look like they're one. Okay, and see if you can take x over y and like quickly figure out which one of those has those slopes. Okay. Like for instance, if we put in zero for x in this one, what kind of slope will we get? Zero. So when x is zero, <coughs> we get a slope of zero. All right. So when x is zero, where on the graph is x equal to zero? Not here. It's on the. Uh, um, on these three, wouldn't that be? Yeah. So a and b are nine. Yeah. Alright, so on C, D, and E along the y axis, we have slopes, horizontal slopes. Of zero, yeah. Can okay, we go look at the x axis? Because what happens when y equals zero? Again, it's yeah. yeah. vertical. So the x axis, all, all three of the little line are vertical. Or horizontal. Um, well, when y is zero, then look at, their, look at our derivative. What, the derivative is going to be what? When y is zero? When y is zero, it's going to be on the time. 
So we're gonna have like a vertical. So we, if, we, if we look at this guy right here, does it look like the slopes are gonna be vertical along here? Um, if you follow kind of the here? trend yeah, of these it's slopes. From here it'll be vertical, but then once we go here it'll... So they're horizontal? Yeah. yeah. This is where y equals zero, right? Yeah. Okay, so does it look like we have undefined slopes along here? Yeah. No. No. It looks like we have more like zero slopes there. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. How about this? Does it look like we're gonna have undefined slopes if we find the trend? Follow the trend of these, uh, these slopes? Yes. Um, yeah, how about these ones? Does it look yes. like? Yeah. yeah, it looks like. Yeah. So that one looks like it's probably out, unless there's like kind of some kind of crazy fluke. And then it's like, but I don't know. So I'm, I'm gonna, I would say concentrate on D and E. Okay, so what else can we notice about the slopes in D and E? I want to help us out. If um, X and Y are the same, it should be a slope of one. If X and Y are exactly the same, uh, like three and three, then we should have a slope of one, or negative two and negative two, and it should be a slope of positive one. So, where do we see that on either end of these? Well, let's see, it'll really be in front of one, positive one, so I have a negative slope on the end. Yeah. You see what the E is? Yeah. Yeah. You see what they're saying, Louis? Yeah, so. Okay, so here at one, one, yeah. we get this negative, yeah, it looks like maybe one, negative, negative one. one. So that's not what should happen. No. And a positive slope. It's a positive here. Yeah. And everywhere in the, for another, maybe a bit of confirmation um, in number E, or, or uh, letter E, in the first quadrant, mm -hmm. all of the first quadrant, what kind of slopes do we have? Positive. positive. Is that what we would expect with x over y? Yeah. Yeah, positive x, positive y, positive yeah. slope. Mm -hmm. uh, fourth, or sorry, third quadrant, well, negative well, x, well, negative well, y. Positive well, well, slopes. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? I would say. Convinced about so, E, that sounds good. Yeah. Yes. All right. Cool. Great job, Will. Go to who's next. Try then. Hey! No calculator for these ones. Tanya, why are you wearing shorts, bud? Function tells us velocity. Uh, velocity. Okay. Uh, distance. Total distance. Error missing Julia. Yeah. Yeah. Antidrider. Good. Remember this? Uh, is this from last time? Remember? Yeah. This? Good. Great. Yeah. So, so the, the distance, the distance function of the yeah, the distance function is the antiderivative of the velocity function. So if we want to find the total distance from zero to two.
Well, there's no product rule for antiderivatives. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this. Into using a few more symbols. Tell us what it is we're trying to do. into our calculator. So you got that function in there. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. I'm gonna show you how to find the, the, the definite interval between A and B for any function. Okay, so you go to second calc, same place we went for the minimum. Oops. Top, top row, there you go. All right, see it? Yeah. The very bottom there? Seven. Seven. It may not let us do it, it might be too zoomed in. Yeah, mine says window range. Okay, so let's then um, just go zoom and six. So there's one, two, and three. So we'll go a little bit past that so we can see what's going on. Okay. So what's 
first I'll show you how to do it. Okay, go ahead and, and go into that, that, uh, that screen, the second cal. Number seven. And what does it say? Lower limit. What's the lower limit of this integral? The lower is zero. Yeah. You can just press zero and enter. Yeah. And then the upper? Two. Two. Enter. Oh, I, I may have I've obviously confused you. Because I'm what? three for no reason. Whoa. Just filling it in. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. Now, what did the question ask for? The total distance. What did this do? Give the area. Give you the area. Some of that area is negative. 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 So that that took some of the distance from the beginning and then took it off, right? Yeah. Remember how we talked about the importance of the word distance? Uh, yeah. Distance is no matter. Yeah, so we consider that kind of that area to be positive, right? Even though it's moving in a negative direction, well, the odometer is still it's going still up, moving. right? So what are we going to do about that? It's kind of a problem solving thing. How are we going to figure out, like, all of this is positive. Like, if we did zero to that, it'd be good. Yeah. Right? Then we, yeah. we need to know how much this is, don't we? Yeah. We want to kind of just take this to be positive, then we'll take this. It'll tell us it's negative, and then we'll make it be positive and add it all together, right? So how do we figure out how much that is? Can't you use the factor to find the zero? Find the zero, okay. How do you do that again? It's in the same menu, second so count. So just to the left of the zero. You got a zero of uh, 1.5, so I would recommend you write that down, right? Because you're going to want to use that. 0.57. Let's take it to like at least. Uh, let's take it to all the decimal places. Zero seven nine six three. Three. Now what are you going to do? Yeah. Still show you that shaded negative area because you haven't made it redraw the whole thing, but the area will be correct to have here. Now what are you gonna do? Positive, yeah, and add it to the Two point two something. Yeah. Two point two six. Yeah. It's D. All right. Great job, man. So that's right. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. 
draft this lots of room to work, so we'll just. 17. 17, not 16. Sign in who's next. Uh, uh, this is some like chapter one. Take that first statement. The limit as x approaches b, you don't know what b is. Uh, I'm trying to figure out. So if the limit exists, what does that look like on the graph? If the limit exists, it means there's an asymptote. Mixing up a couple of uh, getting really close but not quite getting there things. Yeah. So an asymptote is where uh, we could never apparently have a, an x value yeah. of negative one. But the limit is the limit is a, it's a y value. So that means x is a y value. Right? So it's somewhere on the, the, the y axis, like some y value. That the values of the function are getting close to from the right. Itself is, is the, the value of the function or a y value. So, like for here, for instance, the limit does exist because from the right and from the left, they're approaching the same value. Mm -hmm. uh, how about here? Does the limit exist here? Yeah. yeah. From the right, it's approaching, it looks like one, it looks like it's approaching one, and from the left, it's approaching one. How about here? Does the limit exist here? Yeah. Actually, it does. Oh, now, the function doesn't exist there, there is a yeah. hole, but we're not concerned with at B, we're just getting close to B. Oh, okay. Okay? So as we get close to zero in this case, this is like it's getting close to two, this is getting also close to two, so the limit does exist because they're both getting close to two. Okay. So that's a quick little crash course in limits at least in the graph. That's one thing it exists, and then F is not continuous at Like, like, like find all the places where the limit does exist, where the right and the left are coming at the same value. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to like, figure out what the values are. Okay. We don't have to figure out what the values are. We just have to figure out that the right and the left are approaching the mm -hmm. same. So the graph is like coming towards itself from the right and from the left. Yeah, I understand that. Right. I don't understand where these numbers are. These numbers down here for, for yeah. choices? Yeah. Well, B, X approaches B, so B is the value that X could have, mm -hmm. so B is somewhere along the X axis. Uh -huh. Okay. So for instance, let me borrow your pen real quick. Uh, the limit as X approaches uh, 3 mm -hmm. of F of X, what's it look like? It's approaching, what Y, y <laughs> value does it look like it's approaching? It looks like it's approaching 1, so we'll call it 1. Yeah. Okay. About the limit as x approaches two of f of x. Well, my question here is: uh -huh. I understand how to look at it, but yeah. there's no graph. Like I don't know what to do with that. Like, I don't know these numbers. Well, you know the graph is for this. I don't. Oh. So this graph is for this. So yeah, the graph is for the for question 17.
And why are you saying that? Okay, it's not continuous. It's not continuous here, and it's not continuous here, and also it's not continuous here. It would be. Um, So the, the approaching is approaching the y value. So from the left is approaching the two, approaching a y value of two. From the right is approaching a value of one. So does the limit exist? It doesn't. They have to be coming towards each other. Yeah. Because they're coming towards the same spot, but then actu at the actual spot. Okay. But what you're circling is supposed to be a value for b. B is what X is getting close so zero? to. Zero. Yeah. Okay. X is getting close to zero. And Y is getting close to two. Okay. Good job, Alex. So the place where the limit exists, but function are uh, okay. What's up? You have like two minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, we Let's do this one. Okay, so really quick, what I'm going to do is show you kind of what the graph would look like. So at x is 1.1, 1 .1, um, so it's between like 1 and 1.5 in normals. Uh, so at 1.1, 1 .1, we've got a value of 4.8, and then 4.38. Uh, this isn't a very good scale. Yeah, we'll, make, we'll make that 1, 1.5. Okay, so um, 1.3 it gives us 4.58, which is higher than that. Uh, 1.4, 4.7, 3, which is higher than that. Okay, so they're asking us what's true about f prime 1.2. What does f prime 1.2 mean? Slope. Slope at 1.2, right? So the slope at 1.2, I can't find that, but I can't find the slope between 1.1 and 1.2. And between 1.2 and 1.3, right? Uh, and basically, what this, this is saying is that the function is is, uh, is differentiable and uh, it is always concave down. Is what this is saying. So, if you knew the slope here and the slope there, what would you say about the slope at 1.2? Here would be the question. If you have the slope between 1.3 or 1.1 and 1.2. And between 1.2 and 1.3, if you know this slope and this slope, what would you say about the slope at 1.2? It'd be a mix of them. Somewhere between those two. If it's concave down, then it couldn't like be all weird and, and it's steeper. And, like, yeah. You know, it's concave down. It's, it's always, the, the slope is decreasing always. So it's bigger here, it's smaller here. This must be bigger than this, but smaller than this because it's concave down. So somewhere between those two, so what is it? Leave you to do find the slope on those intervals. Yes. Why are you shaking your head? Not gonna make it. Uh, well, I can just hand it off to you. You can find the slope between here and here, and between here and there, right? One two minus y one over x minus x one. So we can find the actual values of the slope and say, well, it's got to be between here and there. 